we gathered today here in order to discuss about a major transformation in art world. We will speak like about that from three points of view. It's from the artist point, from the gallerist point, and I would also maybe invite Grace on that side, and also from point of view as viewers, as collectors. And uh, here where we see like the major shifts and I think that also what worries um, and what inspires Angel on that side. So Angel, can you give us uh, maybe some inputs why you feel this urge to rediscover the relationship in between all us? As an artist anyway, till you become an artist, there's, you have a deep urgency to make art or else you don't be an artist. I think that there are many people who are creative but they would not necessarily become an artist. The drive to be an artist is a, it's a kind of an urgency or a drive. And I've been an artist since I'm 11 years old. I knew when I was 11 I'm an artist and I've been painting ever since. There's been a lot has happened and I'd say in when I was a young artist and in my late 20s about the time when I met Annette and her and I did my first exhibition um, we were launched on into the 80s where art was becoming very commodified and artists were brought to success overnight um, under pressure to produce massive amounts of works for institutions, for art galleries and art houses. The pace of production, new things, new artists, the fast turn turnover started to begin. And I had a, a deep problem with that, uh, that it's very dangerous for you as an artist to start getting into this consumer-oriented speed of producing art. I was lucky because I have three kids, I'm a mother, so a part of me could not afford to get into this speed uh, and this commodification. I, I had to take care of myself because I was a mom. Over the years, I've always been looking for a way, it made sense to me that the artist has to go to walk together with the gallerist and with the viewers, that we are somehow in a boat together. What's beautiful about the relationship I've started with Julia now is that um, I could be her mother. And somewhere it's so inspiring that we have shared visions about what matters in art. There are many things that come into play, but this is, is such an inspiring, uh, what a beautiful evening to have people here from like my earliest collector from my first show. People who know me from, you know, Marco with this um, thing I did when I was still a student. And here sharing that with Julia, who, with whom we start this new journey, maybe feeling that here in this room, that it matters that we communicate what is art. This idea you cruise around with a wine glass and nobody says anything, it's just kind of over. Art and life need to breathe together. The exhibition we have here, it's not just hanging the images, we have a project. Right, to share and you've been doing some projects um, since many years, since 10 yes. years now. What drives you to make projects? Because they're so complex, they also um, like ask for your additional investment, not only like money-wise but also like energy-wise. Every exhibition is, is, you know, you have a drive to do that. But um, the first project I did without a gallerist was in Lugano in 1994 at our local train station. And I had just moved to Ticino and with a bunch of a few colleagues together, a writer and a photographer and a couple of artists, I just went to the train station and I said, we'd like to do an exhibition. In the, in the train station and Ticino said why not you know so it was very nice we found money uh, the TV came and um, it was a very nice thing that, that lasted the whole summer. The last people to actually be interested in it was the art scene and it was like well serious artists would not do a project in a train station and I just felt there was something about that that bothered me I thought it was a fantastic exposure to be dealing with real people in real life and um, in the middle of the train station we did performances and all sorts of things and I felt that that was what was inspiring me this exchange with the people and that so later on in my life I every time I felt like being an artist was just becoming sort of like a shop where you make something, you hang it up and you sell it or you don't sell it. It just didn't seem to be the potential of what I feel is about being an artist. I'd like to share maybe the one that was the most crazy building site. Um, maybe we have a little glimpse of something from that show. I took a space in East London where my son was living and Thomas and I, we rented a trailer 
and dragged it behind our VW bus and drove to London with a whole exhibition, set it up in two days, and we had dynamite people there. I had the chief editor from the Financial Times art department that we somehow managed to get there. We arrived with this truck. The space had a huge roll up like a garage door. We drove in with the truck and um, knowing that we were gonna have like 60 people there for a vernissage and afterwards a sit down dinner in the space with a troupe of dancers that had to figure out it was completely mad. This was one of the dancers that started to have a dialogue with the paintings. I was running and pulling and seeing who can we get to come. We did dinners in the middle of the show. I had worked with a dance troupe where we had did a performance amidst all the paintings and it was full of life. What it gave me was that people enjoyed to be a part of this event and it wasn't just about producing. So this mixture of performance, it evolved also of wanting to make life when paintings come into a space that is not just a passive coming to look at it, but somehow there's an experience involved. And um, I myself wonder sometimes what people feel when they stand in front of a painting. So I worked together with this uh, group of dancers with the idea, what if somebody would stand in front of a painting and feel like dancing? What, what would they do with their body in response to the image? I mean, Marcus would know something about that. I think it's a very primal thing. People have danced to images in primal times where they would make something beautiful and dance to it. That's something that I think intuitively probably has arisen also where art in some cases or the experience of art has lost meaning through it just becoming very strongly business orientated. This idea to bring it back into the circle of life, I guess that's probably what's been driving. And to have a certain ritual maybe. to Some sort of a ritual aspect, yes. So staying true to yourself yeah. and uh, staying consistent. So with the time it comes. Yeah. As an art historian, I also had maybe that struggle because I've come from the law economics and I was quite early with, um, um, like with uh, banking and uh, trading, commodity trading. And um, I had no soul there. And I was like, it's so depressing. I had to do something else. So I had, I had to find, I didn't want just to find a hobby. Um, so I started, um, I went to university and I started to study art history. And for me, just like for three hours speaking about silk screen was like, wow, <laughs> that was the most beautiful thing. I mean, just nonsense, but it was so beautiful. Um, and then I, like, I wished to, to find myself in the art industry, but it was incredibly difficult. And for 10 years, I was frustrated that I could not really fit in. I did some, like lots of underground shows, so to say, like really low budget, um, like in a garage or something like really... Uh, this vision meet, meter or something. Um, but now, when I'm looking back at that, I see that actually all the skills that I gathered, uh, like in it business, and so that they actually bring fruits to me now as a gallerist. Yes, I kind of protected my soul in order to work and to understand and to be in the flow with the artist. So, um, but also my decision to go to the art did not eat up my soul uh, if I would stay just in business. Today, we are also starting this small journey. Today is our launch of fundraising campaign. And uh, that is also another way of cooperating or, or another way of financing uh, for an artist, like his own projects. Can you maybe tell about that, Angela? Yeah, so I, I've always been the idea that um, artists has great freedom and also responsibility. And I don't expect that the world has to you know, uh, is waiting for me in that sense. So I've always been very proactive about if I want to do these projects, I have to find a way to feed them. It's maybe also my mother instinct as well, sort of, I make this baby, then I have to feed it. The slippers I might mention out there are from an installation I did in Milan. I made 600 of these slippers. My whole studio floor was full of these slippers. to paint them and then the seam needed to be opened a bit and doing 600 of these slippers was very mad. Why would I do that? 
it's a part of a preparation of putting energy into something. And I feel that's what people feel when they're on the receiving end. Even packing, you, may, you probably notice I'm very picky about how I pack my works. Just it has to do with what you give, cutting the tape to wrap the work or finding ways to support the work or, and if it's making 600 slippers, it's part of my intention to take care of the project and to take care of what I do. I think it's that that's about, for me, this passage in the wake of the world, it's a desperate feeling that we are going into big, difficult stuff and we have to take care. That's a starting point to take care. So it starts in small things. Yeah, I think that's what's driving that. So Angela, we're in the wake of the world, or we're just starting this journey. Can you tell us a couple words about this? What is this project about and where are we heading to? In the wake of the world is, um, I would say it's an ongoing story that started with a show um, that actually Grace visited in 2019 um, with Gallery Fabian uh, Walter called In the Blue. I was in Basel in the countryside, I was in the Gempen, looking out over the Jura, which is um, an incredible view. And I just looked out and had this vision that the whole um, landscape was just filling up with water, quietly filling itself up with water. And I realized it was a sort of a vision of change that's coming upon us in terms of the planet, in terms of big change of social structures, and that so much is in movement. And this soft building up of water that created this flood. And so I wrote a text that said, you know, the water is rising, will we still be able to love each other? And then the next part of the text says, um, I will build a raft and I will build a boat and ask you and invite you to sit beside me and look out. This was the vision of that. I did a series of paintings called In the Blue based on that. Um, two years later, I had the opportunity, um, I looked for the opportunity to continue this journey with a title called On the Edge of Time. The project for Villa Arconati, there was a major exhibition in Milan in 25 rooms of a Baroque palazzo with some 150 works. It was an extremely crazy exhibition and I realized the title On the Edge of Time was On the Brink of Change. I made the boat and I actually took these painting series of this flood and I made a raft and amongst many other things it was a very opulent show. So the grand buffet before a major change and after that, this title um, emerged in Passage in the Wake of the World. And I thought this boat has now left, it's gone over the edge somehow. So where are we going with this boat? So it's really about transition and change, which we really don't know exactly where it's taking us. And so I, I was very excited that I found this word in English, which means three things. The wake is also what happens when somebody has died and you visit the person, you visit to pay you know, honors to somebody who has passed away. The wake is also the movement behind a boat, so all the bubbles that move behind a boat. And the wake is also to wake up and it's a new awakening. So it's a very strong mixture of things. And the wake, I, I feel as these many things mixed in this turbulence. But basically, um, there is an, um, a strong drive. I'd just like to quickly backtrack um, to our relationship and working together between you know, the viewers, the gallerists, and the artists. This project that I'm working on now um, is ho being hosted by Chambers Fine Art, which is um, a very good gallery in New York that I'm very pleased that they took me into their program maybe a little over a year ago. And Julia has got involved with this project here in Europe because the project, we hope it's going to be an international project that will be seen in New York and in other places in the States and also in Europe. After this opulent um, project in Milan, in this 400 year old Baroque palace in 25 rooms, I thought, what happens in the wake of the world? So my vision was when the boat takes off, you can only take what you can fit in the boat. So I downsized from 25 rooms and 150 works to everything in the show has to fit in one box. So it's a wooden crate 
that is 140 by 2 meters by 50 centimeters high. And it's a, a beautiful wooden box. Um, and the pieces of wood that screw it down. And inside it are 20 new paintings that um, constitute my idea of this journey, that what goes into the next world or into this new world? What, what do I take with me? I tried to pack beautiful paintings and I did a um, series of tree paintings, cedar paintings, and a series of um, landscapes under the title Black Mountain. I live in Tessin, and we live in Tessin, where it's still you can look onto black mountains that don't have lights on them. So there's, because you can't build on them, they're just black. And I love these mountains very much. They, they really feel like you could sort of, they hold you, they can carry stuff. They're, they're trustworthy bodies, these black mountains. So these 20 paintings fit in the box like a puzzle. And when the box gets to the destination, you open it and it turns into a boat. Thomas, who is um, a passionate sailor, helped me design this box such that it really does take the shape of a boat and the, the, the pieces of wood that screw down the lid turn into a mast and I have made a sail out of all my painting rags that I clean my brushes on. Which is another story, but... Um, so then I thought, you know, who is there in this world? Where So the story is, there is um, the boat crosses the Atlantic. It goes on a sea journey, which it does. It will go to New York. And it gets stranded on, uh, on rocks. So there's a metaphor for change and for it's stuck. <laughs> so what happens then? So the next question was, who is on the boat? So I decided that I wanted to have um, uh, dancers for this. And one of my collectors in Miami, she is um, chairman of the Miami Ballet, and I asked her, do you have any contact with some dancers? And she put me in touch with a young choreographer who um, is half Filipino and half American. He's 26, so um, again, this big generational gap. And we have joined, uh, built this project together also with a musician colleague I've been working with since 2015, who was also in this project. Maybe let, let us name them. Yeah, <laughs> so Jesse Bannister, he's half Indian and half British, and uh, Durante Vezzola. We are three of us, and we are building and composing this project together. So Jesse is composing the music, Durante is doing the choreography, and I have created artistic direction for this uh, narrative of this journey. I have not met the choreographer. It's happening all online, which is part of today's world. What's very beautiful about the project is this uh, mixture of cultures, mixture of generations, and mixture of artistic disciplines all pulled together. A complex project, but driven with a great um, um, passion that to come together to do this together. So we will launch uh, this performance on the 20th of May in New York in a fantastic building designed by Ai Weiwei that is known as the Chambers Art Farm. The project hopefully goes to Miami. We have discussions with um, some very interesting uh, venues where it will evolve and maybe change and will be seen in different other parts of the United States. Okay, it's about flow. Yes, it's flow. It's about in flow. When you, whether it's making art and the, the practical thing, like... Well, I have to say, Grace, um, the Villa Arconati was such a crazy project and I got in it so deep and, and, and I had such a good flow. So many things just came into flow, out of which actually we have met Julia. Um, so Chambers suddenly came on board and uh, Chris Mao, who is the director of Chambers, he said, oh my God, he said, this is a crazy project of a lifetime. I'm going to take you into our gallery and you need a curator. And here's Li Shenhua. And so he brings me this large Chinese man <laughs> and says, he's a curator. And I said, OK. <laughs> so then I'm on the journey on the boat with Li Shenhua. And um, Li Shenhua, he doesn't say much, but he just said, I made this raft out of this wonderful wood that's from the building site story. I mean, I could talk for hours. All my stories come from somewhere. All the paintings come from somewhere. And um, that's why you have to come to my studio. Um, but Li Shenhua said, oh, the raft has to be put on the lake. So the next thing is, Thomas, 
Thomas is a sailor, can we make this thing float? Yes, so there we are with Lee Shamor getting this raft onto Lake Lugano. It was just wonderful to be on this raft and we filmed it, um, uh, low budget film again. <laughs> Thomas on one camera, my, my web assistant on another. And, um, and so it goes like that. I just add one word to Julia's question about taking care in the villa. I felt like moving into um, a 400 year old building is also a responsibility. There's 400 years of history, of people's history and lives, and I'm one more that brings one more layer. So I felt I have to listen to what was there and kind of dance with that. I think the time where the artist is just all about me and it's just about me and my art somehow is reaching its limits, that somewhere art and the artists have to give something, take care of something as well. This one part where I hang up this cloth, it says, we fell asleep on the edge of time, dreaming of another world. So in the next project, this phrase is repeated again. Um, the two dancers that uh, wake up on the, find themselves on this stranded in this boat. The phrase is repeated, um, we fell asleep on, on the edge of time, dreaming of another world. And then they wake up in this boat on the rocks. And then finally they get this drive to leave the boat and they go out, and this is done very beautifully with the choreographer, that they leave the boat kind of in a state of amnesia, and they come upon the trees, which are the paintings of the trees that were in the boat. And um, they start this dialogue of mimicking with the trees. And out of this mimicking, they find parts of themselves again. They transcend into this incredible euphoric state, which in choreographically translated between the paintings and the dancers is going to be fantastic. Um, it's different than in a stage work, because in the stage work you have stage sets, but this stage set is not the same as a painting that's been painted to be a painting. So this is a new thing, that you have a painting that in itself is a full body, a work that does not need dancers or music, but then together the dancers are in dialogue with the painting and they are in the full sense dancers. I love this alignment of um, time. It takes, particularly with this classical ballet, until you can stand on your tips um, and the kind of time it takes to, to learn that alongside the paintings that are very um, time consuming. Um, I think it's, that's my message also, that with all the speed we have, um, we are cutting ourselves short somehow, because you get what you give in the end. If you only give two minutes, you'll get two minutes back. And I think this attention to sincerely giving your time is going to make a difference. It will affect our, our idea of loyalty, for example, in the end. And also in your film, you're speaking about caring about the viewer. In what sense you mean that? And what do you expect from the viewer? How to react on that? And also in regards to the upcoming project where not only the paintings plays the role, but also the performance or like the, the whole act of dancing and hearing, listening to music. Well, the audience will be inside with the dancing and the paintings. They will not be looking at a stage. So it's not about consuming a performance. They will be inside it. And um, the project is experimental. I already have the dancers on board. We have already the budget just of shipping and God knows what. And I was not quite sure how we're going to manage. It's always like that with these projects. But I have to say, I want to thank you all in response to, you know, about the viewers, the, the encouragement. Um, you know, a lot of you here have worked for me from very beginning to very new, very new. I think that is where this joins together, that the artist is also, you have to get your energy as well. So part of it is your inspiration, your imagination, your work, and the other does have to do with realizing it's something that's shared. At least that's for me as an artist. I feel very much that so. Uh, but I think we should ask, I would love people to share, you know, what, what do they wish for in living with a piece of artwork? 
These are things that have not been addressed so much in like 20 years ago, if you ask somebody that in an in a art event, it would have been a kind of taboo thing in a way to say, does this work touch you? I would have a quote. Yesterday while preparing uh, for this talk, I've been reading uh, Lewis, the one who wrote uh, Chronics of Narnia, and he has uh, one of the most incredible um, um, novel, um, The Great Divorce. So it's not divorce like in the marital um, divorce, but it's divorce from our life here. So basically the plot is that the souls end up like in this transmissional phase between um, earth and heaven. And there was one painter who was speaking about, like, I was a painter all my life and uh, why I was doing that, because he was asking, like, why I had this urge. When you painted on earth, it was because you caught glimpses of heaven in the earthy landscapes. The success of your painting was that it enabled others to see that glimpse as well. And I wanted to share it because that's the way I feel when I look at the paintings um, of Angela and when I talk to her, that she transmits this uh, glimpses of heaven, of this extra terrestrial realms to us, um, the people who are here, like who are normal, more or less. And um, yeah. I'd like to respond to that, Julia, that I have never felt really that my paintings belong to me. I've said that, I've said this not the first time, but they're sort of like hotel rooms that whilst I'm doing that, um, I have the key and it belongs to me for that time whilst I'm making the work. But then when it's done and it's what it has to be, I, I no longer, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, oh, it doesn't work anymore. It's not my room anymore. And then I see it as somebody else. And it's a mixture of humbling and difficult as well. I know that every painting I do, every brushstroke, I'm taking some energy from somewhere to make that. And so you pass it on somewhere. So you cannot really say it's mine, you know, because you, I mean, I draw, I take a lot of energy now. So encouragement for sure, when I'm scared, reckless uh, to do this show in New York, I'll be like, yeah, but there's energy there. You just, you know, so I think it's a shared journey also for the artist and you receive something to, in order to make something, and so you pass it on. I think that's uh, the connection. And if that happens, it's lovely. And I feel the same on the receiving end too when I receive for other art. One of the things that art forces you to do, not know where you're going. So every, every time I start a new painting, I have the feeling I have a vision of where I want to go, but I don't know how to get there. And then I start and I think, oh, I start and it feels like, yeah, I'm on, it's, it's hard to see the beginning. But for sure, every single painting suddenly hits the rocks and I think it's not working. And then this whole confrontation of not knowing and dealing with not knowing. And I think that's an interesting moment with our society at the moment, because we are hitting a lot of places where we don't know I mean, just governments don't know how to function together. And I mean, there's so much stuff that's really clogged up. So I think the role of culture in, in, is, will increasingly be to soften this anxiety. It has a possibility to say this uncertainty is part of life because in, as an artist, you're, you're kind of moving in that. I tell Julia every time I see her, I've been waiting to meet a young gallerist like you for a long time who understands, you know, this journey together, that, it, that you're, you're walking together with uncertainty. You have to also figure out how to make it, you know, and that also means also to sell things as well. But the core of the journey is somehow to make sense of what you're doing with art and that it makes sense to the people who are sharing that art. And so it goes like that, but it's a kind of flow. Do you feel when you have alignment that it flows? Yes. I think, so if, I, if you ask me one word quickly where that's coming from, trust, I think. Right. Yeah, I think trust and um, feeling very clear about what I do. I had to get here. You know, I mean, and I think I just wanted to add, we mentioned that, that we would speak about for young artists. I think, Lynn, you are working in art. I think it's not easy, and you are thinking about going towards the art um, direction. When it's so product oriented, it's, it's hard to find, to have the space and time to grow and find your language. And there's so much stuff going on. And I think that's something that, I mean, art institutions should take care of their young ones, but young ones should take care of themselves. 
if you if you're doing art take care of yourself that you have time to be to really become who you are because otherwise you just get eaten up and substituted very quickly yes. and yes you always also feel the pressure to also like have an outfit all the time yes. like, I've never done physical I don't, I don't do like physical art but the pressure to like keep it going is high yeah and then in the end, uh, it's hard to grow stuff from inside out. And then it gets, it gets um, fragile at the bottom and then it can collapse. Mm -hmm. Artists has one responsibility to take, I would think of it as like your well, where you have your, your source comes out of, you have to take care of that. That's a respons sort of responsibility for the freedom you have, that you have to take care of this well water. And then you'll be in, you'll be in flow, I guess, you know. I'd like to say thank you very much um, to you, you, Julia, everyone. for hosting. I'd like to thank my husband, who um, is working beside me day and night to help me, because I'm working 200% now. My kids are grown up, and I have the feeling it's just a good moment um, to be in flow uh, as an artist. But there's so much to be done, and um, without you, Thomas, I would not be managing all this. <laughs> Um, from hanging and tying knots and God knows what else. Um, it's a lot. And I'd like to thank you all for being here. Uh, it really means a lot to me. So also from so far, so far back, some, such a beautiful, though we're a small group, such a, a, a circle. And I think we have succeeded to uh, reach our goal um, for this fundraising of this project. So we're very excited. Um, and thank you all for participating.